This, for me, really just shows what an ornate livery can do to bring out the detail in a locomotive. Well, a big hello to you. I hope I find you well. It's great to see you. I'm Jennifer Kirk, welcoming you back up here to the loft on Weir Yard. Now, today, we're going to be taking a look at a locomotive that's been several years in the waiting. It's something that people have been really, really looking forward to. If all that I've been reading in online groups on Facebook and Internet fora are to be believed. Now, of course, this is the Caledonian 812 model, which is a collaboration between Rails of Sheffield and Backman. And it's been very long awaited, but we are nearly there. Just a few more weeks to go before these are available to buy at Rails of Sheffield. Does it live up to all of that expectation? Is this a model that delivers? Is this something that people are going to look at and think, I am glad it was worth the wait? Well, you're going to have to come with me in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. And we'll see if the Caledonian 812 really does live up to expectations. Also, don't forget that we've got a full DCC fitting guide towards the end of this video that gives you the full step-by-step -step guide to fitting a decoder into your model. And this is done in association with Trainomatic. We've also got some affiliate links down below that take you to Rails of Sheffield to allow you to order one of the models featured in today's video. So do go and check them out. But without further ado, Caledonian 812. Let's take a look. Now it's been quite some time since Rails announced their collaboration with Backman and the National Railway Museum for the Class 812 locomotives. But at the time of recording this, we're less than a month away from the expected delivery date of both these and the improved precedent locomotives that we reviewed here on the channel just a couple of weeks ago. Now, Rails of Sheffield have very kindly loaned me a couple of the review examples. So these are fully finished, fully working models, but they've been flown in so that the press can take a look at them. And I've been very, very lucky to be able to borrow a couple of these. Now, the examples that I've got here is the LMS livery. They're also doing a BR early crest and a BR late crest, and I believe one of those is being provided in a factory weather delivery. But then there's also two in Caledonian Railway Blue. Now, uh, I've got one of these here, and this is the uh, earlier blue uh, as it's billed, the sort of lighter colour. And uh, it's one which uh, on the listing it's shown as era two, so that's pre-1923. But when I've been looking into these models, um, what I've been told is that the darker blue, which is what the preserved example uh, suitable for era nine is billed as, that was also a genuine Caledonian railway colour, because I was wondering why they would paint it what ostensibly could have been considered the wrong shade in preservation, but actually it is the right shade. So one is an earlier and one is a later Caledonian railway blue. But uh, both versions are being done by Rails of Sheffield. And this is the earlier blue, I believe. So it's a, a much, much lighter, more vibrant colour. And under the lighting here, it actually looks darker than it does to the naked eye. But uh, I'm going to come to that in a moment. And instead, I'm going to concentrate on the LMS version. I've not had this out of the box yet. And it comes in standard packaging, and this particular example is 35-281Z, Caledonian Class 812, number 17566, in LMS Black. Now, one thing which um, I've yet to find out is uh, it says here 21-pin DCC. Now, I know from having uh, put a decoder into the Caledonian Blue version to be able to run it on the Monday Club, that actually these locomotives come with a next 18 decoder socket. So I don't know whether the packaging for these is going to be updated for release, but do bear that in mind. Um, and uh, I'm going to be doing a full DCC fitting guide for this locomotive a little bit later on 
using one of the Trainomatic Next18 decoders. I've got one here ready to go. Um, the decoder here is quite a small uh, form factor, but um, from what I remember, there is actually a, quite a generous amount of space, even though the decoder socket is in the locomotive rather than the tender. I believe that these locomotives do also come pre-fitted with a speaker. So if you are wanting to fit them with a sound decoder, it's just a case of finding a sound decoder with the correct sound file loaded, and it's just put that in and everything else is taken care of. Now, Rails of Sheffield are also doing uh, sound fitted examples of these, and they will come all set up and ready to go with the appropriate sound file fitted. Now, sliding it out of the packaging, it's uh, all pretty straightforward, same as uh, the usual uh, main range locomotives. On the back, I will just show you this, we've got a brief history of the class, designed and produced by John McIntosh when he was the chief mechanical engineer uh, between 1895 and 1914. Uh, first 17 built at St Rollox Works in 1899 and a further 12 built uh, at St Rollox later that year. Whilst there were mixed traffic locomotives turned out in the distinctive Caledonian blue livery, some had Westinghouse pumps and screw link couplings that enabled them to be used on passenger services, uh, with the rest just generally used on coal and mineral trains. First of the class was drawn in 1946, last in 1963, with number 828 as the sole survivor preserved by the Caledonian Railway 828 Trust. And uh, uh, just looking here, I think, um, if we look closely, Yes, even though this is billed as being the Era 2 livery, this is the preserved locomotive. Um, and I suspect that the darker blue is the same identity locomotive, which in some respects um, I would have thought is a little bit of a strange choice um, to produce two of the different livery examples of the same identity locomotive. Given that this is billed as an Era 2 locomotive, I would have thought a different running number on that would have uh, worked well. But I know that there's a huge demand for people who want the preserved locomotive in a whole host of different liveries to represent it through the eras. Sliding it out, uh, we've also got some fairly comprehensive instructions down here and these show you, it's nice to see, finally we're getting information on how to fit the additional detail parts, where they go, um, and it does list what they are as well, so there's no mystery anymore. And the instructions do at least talk about that next 18 blanking plates in there. So in the sound fitted models, uh, the blanking plate comes uh, as a spare part, otherwise obviously it's going to be fitted. I'm just going to have a look in here, we've got some maintenance points, how to fit the brake gear. Uh, we do have firebox glow and flicker. This does seem to be coming through as a pretty standard thing. So it's interesting here. We do have to do some programming by the look of it to make it flicker, but it does give you um, some information to be able to do this. So we also then get some of the details about the fitting of the next 18 decoder. It shows you how to get the body off the locomotive. And I'm a little bit surprised about this because usually you would find a 21 pin decoder socket in the tender. And judging by the box artwork, it would seem that uh, it's perhaps been a late change to the model to swap out that 21 pin decoder socket for the next 18. So I'm just going to put the box to one side and let's get this out of the blister packaging. Now we do have um, a packet here of detailing parts. I'm not going to fit any of these because these are loners. So I'm just going to leave them be get this locomotive carefully out. And the LMS livery is, to all intents and purposes, um, a little bit on the austere side, but it is entirely prototypical. Now, these locomotives always remind me of Donald and Douglas from the Thomas the Tank Engine books, and I believe that they may have been based on the Cali 812. But in the uh, LMS livery here, it is actually quite a nice finish. We've got a, a slightly satin finish to the black, and I think this works very, very well on steam locomotives. And what it does also highlight is that uh, inside motion, we've got, um, it's not functioning, but I wouldn't expect it to be, but it is nice to see it. And you can see 
just how much this adds to a model by having it present inside the frames there. I'm just looking there. I don't see any obvious joints. Um, there is a line underneath there. I'm not sure whether that's part of the moulding or not. But certainly, um, I think that the motor is in the boiler and the gearbox uh, fits down inside there. It may even be the motor um, sits neatly at the back here. Um, because we do get all of this uh, space between the frames is completely open, just like the prototype, and it is really, really nice to see. The LMS version has no lining. We've just got that serif uh, drop shadow font on there, and uh, it really is done nice and sharp. So you can see there, there's no sign of fuzziness. It is straight and true. The number on the locomotive, again, Really nicely uh, printed on there with a 3F up there. We've got the Westinghouse air pump, I believe that is. And uh, again, a really, really nice molding on there. Does look great, separately applied, all that appropriate pipe work. And it does look really, really nice. Safety valves do appear to be turned metal. And then we've got the whistle behind there is from a springy plastic. There's uh, no gaps that I can see around the dome. It is really tightly on there. And again, the funnel is done really, really nice. I do like the saddle around the bottom. Captures the look of the prototype absolutely perfectly. And of course, the appropriate darkness down the funnel with no sign of the, uh, the bottom there to kind of break the illusion. It's got an LMS works plate on. I know the LMS were quite keen to cast new works plates on all of their locomotives, regardless of original originating companies. So you tend to find that even on pre-grouping locomotives, the works plate will still say LMS on an LMS liveried locomotive. Um, just to bring over the Caledonian one, there is no works plate at the front, uh, but you can see that this is a much more ornate livery. I think the works plate is that on the side with the locomotive's number. But you can see that Westinghouse air pump really comes alive in this livery. Again, we've got the motion on the inside there, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The locomotive does come with a cast metal load. Uh, the style on these is getting better and better, but you can, I believe, remove this. And if I just uh, very carefully tease that free, what we have is a fully modelled representation of what the tender would look like when empty. It's not as deep as what I've seen in some other locomotives. And what is interesting is it does have this piece of plastic in, I guess, to uh, just to stop the uh, metal casting here from scratching. It's actually rather smooth plastic insert um, and actually it's a nice little touch. So I am going to put that back. Uh, let's just see. So it goes in that way round. There we go. And then we've got the fully modelled uh, tender front there as well. And uh, the full plate is actually fully poseable. It's a little bit stiff, which is what you want, because you don't want it riding up and down in uh, motion. And when we look into the cab there, you can see the firebox glow just through there. But the rest of the cab, we've got all those gauges, pipework, everything separately coloured and fitted. And it really is quite a pleasure to see. Again, another area that Backman do ever so well is the flush glazing, both on the inside it is flush and of course the outside. And that's something um, that I think does have a certain something for a model. Looking to the front face, that is captured quite convincingly. And we've got the shed code there, 28A. Buffers are correct pattern and they're sprung loaded. Just enough spring loading on there. So we've also got factory fitted front coupling in a NEM pocket, uh, which is quite easy to remove or indeed replace the coupling should you so wish. We've got all main wheel pickup plus pickup electrically from the front and rear axles in the tender, which does make this a pretty sure footed locomotive when running. The uh, tender drawbar is, it feels slightly spring loaded to some degree, um, but what you can do is adjust that if you wish, 
by tightening up that screw. So if you want it close coupled, you just push that all the way in and then screw that down. It will clamp that and stop the locomotive and tender from being able to drift apart. Um, so it is nice to see that we've got that level of uh, adjustment in there, but it is also possible for the locomotive and tender to come unhooked, but they will remain tethered by this cable. It is interesting that whereas normally we've seen four cables going through to the tender, we've only got the two there for the actual um, power pickups. Um, and that is interesting because it does mean that the, um, it's probably one of the reasons that the decoder is not in the tender. And I'm actually starting to suspect that part of the reason for this is the firebox flicker. It's much easier if that can be connected direct to the decoder rather than having to have two more wires bridging the uh, the gap. So I am beginning to see why they have changed this from 21 pin in tender to next 18 in the locomotive. The locomotive wheels correct pattern. Nice to see as well that the counterbalance weights are correctly placed. I know I've seen people comment about this before and the reason that these are in different positions is because you've got to think what they're doing on a real locomotive. They're a counterbalance to unequal weight. So on the front and rear axles, those balance weights are to balance the offset crank so that the wheel doesn't have a wobble as it goes round, which would make it a very rough rider at speed and put a great deal of strain on things like bearings. But on the center axle, that is a much bigger wheel balance weight and it's in a different position because actually it is balancing out the weight of the big end bearings that are going round. That's where the pistons and the connecting rods are connecting and applying that power to this centre wheel and that's why it has this much bigger counterweight in a different location. We've got some detail there on the base of the firebox and the brake rigging does actually come factory fitted. The paperwork suggested otherwise, um, but I can tell you that the uh, brake rigging is entirely factory fitted. So the only additional items are things like buffer beam detail and some uh, just little uh, doors that go on the side there, uh, which is actually quite nice uh, because I do often find that the brake rigging can be a bit of a faff to fit. Now I'm going to put that to one side and I'm going to bring in the Caledonian Railway model. And this for me really just shows what an ornate livery can do to bring out the detail in a locomotive. So on this, um, as I alluded to before, it really brings out this air pump, but all of that lining on the splashes, on the wheels, it really does make this pop to use the parts of God. I, I feel like an old fogey. It's like, yeah, I'm hanging with the kids. I use the uh, all the kids' expressions, but certainly, it really does make a lot of this detail stand out. That tender frame, the outside frame tender, with that extra lining there. And I'm just going to bring up the LMS version because that's detail that's um, not necessarily as obvious. It is there on the LMS livery, but that lining really does bring it to the fore. The lettering on this is really nicely done. I do like that Caledonian Railways crest. Now we're gonna get that under super magnification, but it does look the part here under the camera that I've got. Again, we've got that works plate with the 828. Uh, we'll see what that looks like under closer magnification. Um, and what's interesting is that quite clearly uh, they have tooled up for different versions. So um, I'm just gonna show you there the safety valve. So you can see between them, the LMS version has different safety valves to the Caledonian Railway version. Um, and it is always nice when you see these differing versions tooled up. Inside the cab, we've actually got this kind of chocolatey fawn brown rather than that cream, which actually makes those gauges at the top stand out. Again, glazing flush inside and outside. Um, but really does look quite nice, slightly more toned down with the brown over the um, uh, that creamy colour in the LMS version. And then we do have more of that red finish on the back of the cab. Uh, again, firebox flicker in there, uh, just visible. And then we've got, uh, let's just have a look 
is the interior of this coal load going to be the same? I suspect it is. And uh, that there. So, yeah, exactly the same between the different models. I'm just going to place that back in. And it is quite a tight fit. So when I turn these upside down, it isn't just falling out. It does stay put. Um, and certainly that is um, it's quite helpful because I found on certain other models, uh, the coal load just falling out on a whim does make it quite fiddly. Um, we've also got the water fillers on the back, a little divider there, which on the real one would stop the coal from getting into that area. And again, let's just compare the two. Do we have any detail differences? No, they are absolutely the same. Um, but you can also see that flared tender top, the shape has been captured perfectly. The way it just flares out and uh, sort of tumble home over, uh, really, really nice. My personal preference is to this Caledonian Railway livery, it has to be said. Um, I have seen the pictures of the darker one. It's much more of a sort of a midnight blue. And my personal preference is to this lighter version. I think it really does show off the detail on this locomotive really, really nicely. One of the other areas where we've got a detail difference between the two, if we look at the smoke box dart on the LMS version, We've got a different uh, kind of a spinning wheel type uh, assembly on the front of the Caledonian version. And you can also see on the Caledonian version that extra finishing with the number CR828 there on the buffer beam. And those buffers do look special with the lining around the, uh, uh, the shanks there. Really, really nice. They are turned metal. Looking to the back of the tender again. All the detail is there and the number 828 emblazoned across the back of the tender. For me, this really is the standout livery, but I know a lot of people do model different periods. Um, if you're going to go for the preserved example, then the darker blue is billed as the preserved one. Um, but um, I'd personally go for that. Um, I just keep coming back to this particular version. And it is definitely one that really, really does stand out for me. Um, we've got fully metal handrails around the boiler. They are actually quite durable. No risk of them getting broken or coming off under everyday handling. It really does come together quite nicely. We've also got that rivet detail across the cab roof. It's relieved enough that you can see it, but not so much as to be over scale. Uh, again, let's just check, is that the same? That is the same as the LMS version. So some very subtle differences between the two. Um, is that the same funnel? It does look to be the same funnel. Although um, I think it's just delivery makes things look a little bit different. Although we don't have the rivet detail. The smoke box is different on this. So we're looking there. At the front and back of the smoke box, no rivet relief, although we do have some really impressive rivets on those splashes. And if I go back to the LMS version, on the front there, it is a completely different smoke box. We've still got that rivet detail on the splashes. You see how they've actually modeled that very subtle difference with the smoke box. That is actually really nicely done. We've also got um, some additional pipe work there down the side. You can see model just there down the side above the handrail. And I think I could be wrong, but uh, yeah, so that again, there is actually, the more you look at this, the more there are detailed differences between the two. And I do think that that is a really nice that they've gone to all that trouble for what are actually a few quite simple detail differences but um, it means that they can model this at every stage of its life. I really do like that. Now, it also got the reversing rod. It really does stand out as something special on this. And the, the blue really shows off how they have captured that quite complex shape on the firebox so, so well. Okay, I don't normally do this, 
But just as a little insert, after I filmed all of the video, um, the Rails of Sheffield sent over a sound fitted weathered BR version. And I was really intrigued to hear the sound version because this is something that's not been publicly uh, demonstrated at all. So this is the first opportunity for anybody to have a listen to just what the Kali 812 sounds like with the factory fitted sound option. So without further ado, let's take a look at it. The sound program on this locomotive is actually very, very comprehensive. We've also got a number of features which are reliant on other features. So, for example, the firebox flicker effect is dependent on the opening and closing the firebox door. There are different functions depending on whether the locomotive is in motion or stationary. So, uh, what we're going to do is just um, open the firebox doors and you can see that there's actually a really quite pleasing flicker effect out of the box it's programmed and works really really well now if we then with the firebox doors latched open begin uh, running the locomotive then we get a different flicker effect with some yellow as well And you can see that actually it's very reminiscent of the locomotive if it was being fired at speed with the extra draft. And then if we hit F6 again, that shuts the firebox door with the accompanying sound as well. And you can see that as we come to a halt, Stop that completely, we get the brake squeal, and then the firebox flicker just doesn't have that yellow edge to it, it doesn't look like it's got as much of a draft, which I really do like, it's an absolutely uh, wonderful touch. So let's get those shut, and then we've also got F11, so let's just take a look at that, so I'll just bring up F11 on the uh, uh, controller. And that is the blower, sound only, um, and if we then put F6 on, we also get that extra flicker as well. So turn the blower off, and turn it back on again. So there's some really nice subtle functions on this that I do really like. We've also got an option for a heavy load, so if we just close the firebox doors and I'm just going to turn off the blower. So if we hit F5, nothing immediately happens, but uh, when we start to run the locomotive, this should be under a heavy load. Turn F5 off. Turn F5 on. There's a subtle difference there in the actual uh, exhaust tone. 
So I'm really, really liking this. Uh, another option here, let's just see, we can also add rail joint clatter. So I'm going to put that on. And of course that's not going to do anything until we start it moving. It's a, a very subtle sound effect, but it is there. I'm just going to turn that off so I don't forget that it's on. And uh, looking down through all of the different functions, there is definitely plenty for people to have a go at playing with. Guard's whistle. You can also change the sound effects of the safety valve by altering CV162. Um, so we've got a salter type, um, which is the default, and the Ross Pop valve is um, a, a, achievable by changing CV162 to a zero. So there's some really, really nice effects going on here, and it's certainly one of the more well thought out sound packages that I've seen on a locomotive. Uh, and very much this is winning me over. Um, I really love that Caledonian light blue, um, but I'm looking at this weathered BR with the sound, and I am really quite taken by this. Uh, the sound from this locomotive is pretty good. We've also got all of the refinements um, of the Caledonian model, but this light factory weathering is really well applied. And I have to say that um, I'm really, really impressed by it. In its BR weathered livery, it actually really does look good. And I'd go as far as recommending that if you do go for the BR version, this weathered version is certainly the one to choose. It's not overdone and the locomotive looks cared for, just it's been out and about in a dirty environment and it's just taken a little bit of that clean sheen off. There's no sign of rust, there's no sign of water scale, but certainly this weathering mutes down the locomotive to a very pleasing degree. Everything else on this locomotive is uh, akin to what we saw with the LMS and the Caledonian railway versions. All in all, the sound fitted version has really blown me away. I thought my favourite was going to be the Caledonian blue, but really this one is turning my head. And I might have to change which one I've got on order. So we come to the part of the video where I'm going to show you how to DCC fit this model. And it's really, really easy. For this, you need a Next18 decoder. And I'm going to be using the Trainomatic Next18 decoder. We do have a link to Tramfabrik down below, who are the UK stockists for the full Trainomatic range. We're also going to be using our handy Jeweler's screwdriver set. So what I'm going to do is just carefully pick this up and make sure that you support the tender as well. And then uh, what we're going to be doing is quite simply, there's two screws. We've got one here. We undo that. And then the front one, if you need to, you can remove the brake rigging, but actually it does just move slightly out of the way. And we're going to undo that. And then very, very carefully, we can just slide the locomotive body off the chassis and there you have the locomotive ready for DCC fitting. Just going to put the body safely over there. Just remember that the locomotive is still attached to the tender and you're going to have to make allowances for that. Um, but just so you can see here, the locomotive itself, we've got the base of the boiler is uh, in situ with it. So that all fits neatly inside the boiler casting. And then we've also got a weight there in the front, uh, just adding a little bit of extra adhesion. Um, but there is still plenty of space. You can see here, this is the blanking plate for the next 18 socket. Just simply a case of a grab at this end and bring it out, it should just pop out. That is quite large. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the next 18 decoder from Trainomatic, very carefully get this out of the box. And you can see how much smaller the decoder is than the blanking plate. 
So what we're going to do is orientate that again and you want it this way round with the bulk of the decoder pointing back towards the tender and then invert it so that the sockets match up and what you will find is uh, just place it in the right place and you can feel it click into place you don't need to apply a lot of pressure and um, it will just click into place and it's as simple as that now we also have the three solder tabs you can just see there if you want to add a stay alive i personally don't believe that these locomotives need it but the function does exist if you choose to do so and then it's just simply a case of refitting the locomotive body that just is a push fit down onto there and then let's turn it upside down reinsert the rear screw Carefully screw that up and tighten up this front one. And if you've removed the brake rodding, then we just need to push that back into place. The pair of tweezers just very carefully reinsert that. Trying not to pop it out the other end. And it's as simple as that. And the locomotive will be on address number three and we just put it on the programming track and can program that for any other address i'm going to take a look inside the tender uh, it's uh, not something that you would need to do but i am just a little bit curious to see what if anything is inside here so i'm just going to undo what appear to be the four screws that hold it all in place I'm just going to move the tender top and uh, on the face of it there is very little at all inside the tender we've just got a very small circuit board for where the left and right power goes through um, there is actually a reasonable amount of space inside here that you would need to bridge across if you're going to put something like a stay alive into this area when running the current drawer on the locomotive is surprisingly low so this is the alpha meter for the layout and as I start that locomotive running and up to 100% speed you can see that there is not a huge increase in current draw. When going from full ahead to full reverse the trainomatic decoder is automatically programmed for actually quite a, a pleasing deceleration stop and then re-acceleration process. So there are no CVs to change to be able to get this much more realistic operation. When it came to running, both of these locomotives ran just fine on wear yard. I had no trouble whatsoever with derailments, uh, although they did seem to struggle a little bit for grip when I tried them on my 5% gradient. That said, that is far steeper than most model railways would ever have to contend with. On the main line, which does still feature some gradients, they handled the trains that I asked of them pretty well with no sign of wheel slipping. Trains themselves weren't particularly long, but they were still long enough to represent prototypically accurate trains and I felt that these locomotives performed perfectly adequately for the tasks that the average modeler is likely to throw them onto. Out of the box, they ran on DC well, although the instructions do say to run them in for a length of time in each direction. On the DCC Concepts Rolling Road, I did find that the LMS example was slightly growly at lower speeds, but with prolonged running, this did start to disappear and probably put some credence into the running in in the instructions. The firebox flicker was something that did puzzle me a little bit. I tried these with a number of different manufacturers decoders and what I found is that they all performed much the same when it came to that firebox flicker. Namely that two lighting functions were used and these turned on either a red LED 
or a yellow LED with no native flickering involved. And I did feel that it was perhaps a little bit of a missed opportunity to have the locomotives themselves natively support that flickering firebox glow without any need to go into the CVs and programming the decoders. Just a little note is that whilst the instructions state that uh, F1 and F2 turn on the firebox glow, as either red or yellow and you can set that up through CVs to be a combination of both flickering. On the Trainomatic decoder these are found on F3 for the red and F4 for the yellow. So I turn now to the scores. First up is build quality and on this I was very impressed. Even with extensive handling, not a single piece of detail has come loose or fallen off from either of these locomotives. It's great to see that the standards are really being upped by the manufacturers in making these locomotives not just highly detailed, but resilient for everyday use as well. Gone are the days where we see a rain of small pieces into the box that leave a user quite puzzled as to where they're supposed to go back to and living in fear of handling their prized models. Not so with these, and they should stand up to everyday usage without any problems whatsoever. So I've got no qualms about giving these a 10 out of 10. Next up is running quality. Out of the box, the LMS version, as I've said before, did growl a little bit at low speeds. This did start to ease with extensive running in, but it was still present after over an hour of running. Although the Caledonian Railway liveried version didn't suffer the same fate, so it may be a little bit of variance in the production run, but it was there on this review model and I have to take these as I see them. They did struggle a little bit on the steeper gradients on Weir Yard, but overall it was still more than adequate for the average layout. So. I'm going to give these an 8.5 out of 10. When it came to DCC fitting and innovation, it was a little bit strange that the box says that they have a 21 pin socket. I'm going to put this down to just being an oversight at the factory. I suspect that they have been planned from the outset to feature a Next 18, in part because of that firebox flicker. By having the decoder in the locomotive itself, it does need a smaller form factor decoder to be able to fit in there, and this does then mean that you don't need extra wires trailing across to the tender. That said though, it did strike me that there was maybe a missed opportunity to acknowledge the fact that a lot of people do want to fit things like Stay Alive, or also mega bass style speakers, and the tender is the ideal location for this. By not having the extra wiring across to the tender to cater for these such installations, it does make it a much more challenging option to fit something as simple as, say, a stay alive. There isn't a lot of extra space in the locomotive to be able to do this, and it is going to take a little bit of careful thought. I do like the fact that a speaker is included within these locomotives, and it is a very, very small installation wherever it may be. I couldn't spot it when I had the body off, but the paperwork that comes with the locomotive does extol this as a feature, and it is something we are seeing more and more. And given that the speaker is often the hardest part of any sound installation to find the perfect location for it, it does take the difficulty of this away. There are also factory sound fitted options available, so for those who really just want it to work out of the box, this is an option available as well. Overall, pretty pleased with the installation, although that lack of flickering firebox glow without programming the CVs again comes back to haunt it a little bit. So I'm going to give this an 8.3 out of 10. When it comes to accuracy and quality of finish, really there was nothing to find wrong with these, and believe me, I did really look. I love the way that they've tooled up for different minor variants between members of the class and over the lifespan of the locomotives, and that just shows that there is a great attention to detail. For me, the Caledonian Railway Blue livery really was the massive standout, and there was just nothing to find wrong with any of that detailed lining. Overall, with nothing to find wrong, I'm going to give these a 10 out of 10. Finally, value for money. These locomotives weigh in at a, just under the £200 mark. 
in this day and age with locomotives already starting to top £300 plus it is really pleasing to see that rails were able to keep the prices down to roughly the area that they pitched from at the start. Unfortunately, we're going to have to expect more and more expensive prices. It's a fact of life with the increased cost of shipping from China and also the increased cost of production out there as well. But do these models offer value for money? Well, I still think that they do. You get a lot of model for your money. And there's some really innovative things going on here, particularly with the Caledonian Railway liveried versions. These are an extremely pretty locomotive. And I'm going to give these a 9 out of 10 for value for money. And that gives us a final score of 45.8 out of 50. It's a great score for what is certainly to be a great locomotive that will prove exceptionally popular. I'd like to extend a huge thanks to Rails of Sheffield for loaning these models for review. As I said at the beginning of this review, they are set to be in the shops from November 2021, which is just a few weeks away at the time of recording this video. Already some of the different versions are proving exceptionally popular, so if you want one, do get your skates on. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that video and found it informative. If you did, please tickle that like button, share this video and subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so and you'll be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. We've also got a link down below in the description box to our Patreon channel and this is a great way that you too can help to support the channel and help us to make the videos that you want to see. I also would love to hear from you in the comments section down below. Do you agree with what I thought of this Caledonian 812 model? Is this something that you've been really, really waiting for? Or is there something that you think that I've missed in the review that really needs to be pointed out? I'd love to hear from you all and I do read every single one of the comments. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying you take great care of yourself. And until next time, happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Sparky107107, George Botterini, Chris Moss, Robert Steers, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grantline Products, Sam Yates, Dale Williams, John N. from NC, NYMR ish, Jonathan Foster, Peter, Graham Foster, Clifford Ison, Larry W. Grant, NI Railways 4000 class, Ian Coulson, and Alan Dickerson. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.